Hello, and welcome to The Psychonaut Show with Dr. J.K.B. This is John K. Burton, M.D., psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And on this podcast, your captain on these voyages to explore strange new worlds in inner space. Our mission is to uncover knowledge that will ultimately make us more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily lives. In this episode, we are going to be exploring transitional space. Now, The Psychonaut Show is about exploring inner worlds and applying what we find there to our external lives. But in this episode, we enter a very different world. It's kind of hard to describe a sort of mist that exists between our inner world and outer reality. But the healthy functioning of both our inner worlds and how we function in our everyday lives depends on this world, the transitional space. The concept comes from D.W. Winnicott, who was a pediatrician, and then he became a psychoanalyst. And he said that there is, quote, an intermediate area of experiencing, and he called it a kind of resting place where we can wrestle not only with our inner thoughts and feelings, but also the reactions to them, how we imagine them being in the outer world. But it's also not subject to the consequences of reality. It doesn't have the no going back feeling of when we actually take an action. And in his characteristic zen-like way, he called the transitional space or what he called transitional phenomenon to be the first thing that we experience that is not me, but it is also not not me. I think we're getting a little abstract and maybe a little bit surreal, so I want to bring it down and tell you about a situation where the concept of the transitional space, this not, not me, actually really helped someone in real life get out of a stuck situation. So I was seeing um, a patient who was a painter for a long time, and she was not quite a starving artist. She had been to art school, and she had some grant money and had done some small shows, but she had been working a really long time without much recognition. But she got her first exhibit in a small but well-known downtown gallery, and it explored themes of her experience growing up in a very small town, a very poor town in the Dominican Republic, and it was very successful. She got attention from important collectors who were focused on the Latino art scene, and more than one of the larger galleries in the city was interested in hosting her next exhibit. So now she had more money, and there were people who were following her, and there was a great deal of interest, and there was a venue all set up for her second exhibit. She had really achieved what she had been working so hard for so long to achieve. And not only that, but she was given total creative freedom. She could do whatever she wanted. And she had an idea of what she wanted to do that was very clear. She was going to do a follow-up of her first exhibit, in this one exploring her experience of coming to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic, and especially exploring her mixed feelings about it, that she had achieved what she set out to achieve and was being welcomed and brought in by the predominantly white, privileged class. And there was a sense of pride about that, but also a sense of disconnection, both from her home and from the new world that she had entered. The perfect subject for a creative exploration. Mixed feelings, contradictory feelings, and she was very excited about this project. But she could not put her brush to her canvas when she kept going back to her studio. She got terribly blocked in her ability to express her ideas in her art form that she had worked her whole life to master. And she kept getting stuck around the anxiety about what her family or her community back home would think of her painting. It wasn't just a sort of vague anxiety about what they would think, but these images of hurting them, that she shouldn't reveal her thoughts about them, that she was betraying them in some way, was 
coming into the studio and blocking her work. And this was, in fact, the subject of what she was trying to express, but the the sense of reality of it, the, the nearness of it, really was getting in the way of her being able to express herself. Now, in reality, and she knew this, her community back home had no such feelings about her in this way. They were very proud of her and actually interested, too, in her experience. Uh, not just unilaterally proud, but, you know, interested in her, her what she had to say. But this knowledge didn't help her, didn't release the creative block. And she tried many things. She tried meditation. She read books on creativity. She was told to think of these thoughts as the enemy and fight against them as she goes into the studio. Or she read some Buddhist writings that talk about these thoughts that come from the monkey mind and we have to transcend them. But none of this really helped her. The, the, the feeling was so real to her. So at a certain point in our conversations, I told her about Winnicott's idea of the transitional space, this resting place between our inner worlds and our outer worlds and it really struck her in fact while we were talking she wrote it down and she said that it gave her a new way to orient her creativity it gave her an actual place to play freely and in fact winnicott said that play itself happens in the transitional space this idea helped her to anchor her work and her mindset in a place where her thoughts and feelings were not just internal and totally imaginary. They were not me, in Winnicott's words. But also, there were not yet the consequences. She could feel the strength of her community's reactions and her feeling about her community's reactions. And she could feel the art world watching. But at the same time, it was not yet in reality. It was not, not me. The problem of a creative block for an artist has been written about a lot, of course. And there are plenty of techniques for overcoming a block. And many of these techniques come from various branches of psychology, you know, performance psychology. There are many mental techniques to combat these negative thoughts things that come from cognitive behavior therapy, for example, and, and others. But my point here is that actually thinking about this idea of the transitional space helped this particular artist overcome her own creative block because she understood something about herself and how all our unconscious minds work, according to psychoanalytic theory. It was not about trying to override the unconscious mind, but to see it more clearly. And that's the theme of the Psychonaut Show, but let's get a little bit deeper into this idea of Winnicott's. So as I said, he was a pediatrician. He observed children like Melanie Klein and Anna Freud, and Melanie Klein was actually his supervisor, so this was back in the 40s and 50s. But unlike them, he observed infants. He observed mothers and babies together. <laughs> He observed the very common phenomenon of little children having a soft object, a blankie or a teddy that they carry with them. And today we even call this a transitional object, commonly now, and that comes from Winnicott. But at the time, the idea was that this was just the child's oral drive projecting itself onto a random object such as the blankie or the teddy. It was all about what was going on inside and how that was manifested outside. But Winnicott thought that there was something more going on. He thought there must be a practicing phase, that the blankie or the teddy was a practicing phase between imagining relationships and actually having them. Now, the thing about the inner experience, the, the oral drive that's inside, and Melanie Klein came up with the idea of internal objects, which are relationships, but they're felt to be totally inside oneself. And the inner world is also the place of unbridled imagination. It's where you imagine something completely eternally, and it's all under your control, and there are no real consequences for any thought or feeling. But of course, in the external world, we have to deal with reality. We have to deal with other people's reactions, even the laws of physics. You can't be two places at once. You can't make opposite decisions at the same time. And when we deal with other people, we have to manage our thoughts and feelings very tightly. If we don't, we might come off as offensive or even crazy, we worry. And I'm speaking primarily about 
uh, the, how we develop into adults. These are the challenges of managing the inner world to the outer world that as children we have to figure out. And this is where Winnicott theorized the idea of the transitional space. That's the space that the teddy bear occupies. It's not me, but it's not totally out of my control either. It's not, not me. It is a space that is, as he put it, not under magical control, but not outside control either. So far on The Psychonaut Show, we have met dramatic and passionate characters from the history of psychoanalysis, and Winnicott is also a real character, distinct in his own right and worth getting to know. I kind of think of him as a kindly British grandfather, standing outside and creating some balance for the more fiery Central Europeans that came before him. And sometimes he seems like everybody's favorite theorist, even people outside of the field of psychoanalysis, like the cartoonist and graphic novelist Alison Bechdel, whose memoir about growing up in a home with a mentally unstable father titled Fun Home, later became an award-winning Broadway musical. And that's pretty cool for me to see because I used to read her comic strip, Dykes to Watch Out For, back in the 1980s in Boston. But in her sequel to the memoir, where she explores her relationship with her mother called Are You My Mother, she fantasizes about Winnicott and writes about him and draws him. He shows up as sort of a fairy godfather to compensate for her actual relationship with her troubled parents. She fantasizes about his working with the children in his pediatric practice and walking to his analysis with James Strachey in post-war London, who James Strachey was the one who translated Freud into English from German first. And in fact, when you read his papers, there is kind of a whimsical feeling to them. He rarely references other people. It almost seems sometimes like he's stream of consciousness. But there's sort of a humility to him too. And he really seems to understand the darker sides of people and get them. One of his famous papers is called Hate in the Countertransference, where he lists from A to O or P or something, why it's normal for a mother to hate her infant. And of course, he's not talking about actual hateful acts or abuse or anything. He's talking about, again, our inner worlds and how complex and dark they can be. And he said at one point that we have to enter the patient's psychosis with them and in, get in touch with our own psychosis or insanity, which sounds a little scary to think that you might be going to a therapist for help and they're insane, but of course that's not what he meant. What he meant is that we all have a little bit of craziness in us and we need to be compassionate and connect with each other around that. Now some people say that his views were probably influenced by the fact that his own mother was depressed and he had to care for her. But in his interest in the experience of the infant becoming aware of his or her environment and dealing with the relationship with the mother as it grows, he came up with some very uh, wise quotes and ideas like the good enough mother, where he says that actually the strive for perfection is, is not a good thing, is a harmful thing. And what a child needs is a good enough mother. And he also had ideas about the true self and the false self. And today people are talking lots about authenticity and finding your true path. And his ideas about what is the true self and where does the false self come from ought to be very important in these conversations. And we'll probably do an episode on that coming up. One of his other quotes is, there is no baby without a mother, which means that we come to know ourselves through our relationships with our parents. And it's almost like he's quoting quantum physics, the idea that there is nothing there unless it is observed. And Winnicott's idea of transitional space that seems so surreal in the beginning of this episode is useful in everyday life. And like many of the concepts here on The Psychonaut Show, it has an application on a larger scale too. For example, understanding the role that religion has in our lives. 
Winnicott talked about the religious experience of Catholics and their belief in transubstantiation during communion. The sacramental wafer is transformed into the body of Christ, not as a substitute, that would be Protestantism, but as the actual body. And that this must occur in the transitional space. It's not imaginary, but it's not real, like a psychotic patient believed. For example, in contrast, Winnicott described an actual patient of his who asked him if he had enjoyed eating her after communion. Her belief occurred in external reality. She needed others to believe it. She was psychotic, which had nothing to do with her religious beliefs. In some ways, the idea of the transitional space reminds me of another aspect of Christianity that comes from its mystic tradition. The ideas that come from the book, The Dark Night of the Soul and The Cloud of Unknowing. These ideas are not the same thing in any way or and don't have the same intention. One is about the soul's striving for union with the divine and the other is about the infant's psychological development. But the idea that there is a place which is different from reality but also not completely inside us, that there is an in-between is what is in common and also that this in-between place is vital to our growth, not only vital but where the growth occurs. So perhaps the idea of transitional space can help us have more religious tolerance even when other people's ideas seem kind of even crazy. But my favorite example is from South Park, the Imagination Land episode, which is actually a trilogy. To me, it is the most profound statement about the importance of the transitional space that I've come across. It explores how anxiety can interfere with our ability to think in the episode, the government has decided that terrorists are in our imagination and they find a way to send a nuclear weapon into our collective imagination. In this, they are like Winnicott's psychotic patient who does not see the difference between reality and imagination and the transitional space. The government is being concrete and literal-minded. Winnicott also said that the breakdown of this ability is part of addictive behavior. But the plot and exploration of this idea in South Park's characteristic way, gorgeously subversive, and we could spend a whole episode just on what's going on in that show, but the lines at the end where Stan says, I mean, whether Jesus is real or not, he, he's had a bigger impact on the world than any of us have. And the same can be said for Bugs Bunny and, and Superman and Harry Potter. They've changed my life, changed the way I act on the earth. Doesn't that make them kind of real? That is a perfect description of the transitional space. So what's the lesson here? I'm going to put it in Winnicott's own words. He said, quote, No human being is free from the strain of relating inner and outer reality, and that relief from the strain is provided by an intermediate area of experience which is not challenged. Now this is the place of art, as in my patient, religion, and of course, imaginative play, which adults sadly lose touch with often in our society. But that's not to say that reality has to be depressingly limited in contrast. The transitional space helps us to optimize our options in reality. A patient once said to me, as he was coming to terms with the limits of his own reality, I guess I'm learning you can't go on all the rides. And I said to him, oh, you can go on all the rides, you just can't go on all of them at once. And that's really the difference between magical control, where we don't have to pay attention to the limits of reality, and doing what the transitional space allows us to do, which is expanding our options in reality. So understanding transitional space allows us a way station to practice that doesn't leave us just in our heads and allows us to come out into the world even more effectively. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. 
Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X I M E R.co.